You are listening to Lone Star Community Radio on 104.5 KCZWLP Conroe and 106.1 KZCCLP Conroe and worldwide on IRLoneStar.com. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Extension Hour. I'm Amy Ressler, County Extension Agent for Family and Community Health here in Montgomery County, and we are doing a Zoom show today. So we've got um, some of some of my good friends here with us by Zoom. We've got Sanja Davis. Sanja, you want to say hi? Hello. So Sanja is the FCH agent or Family and Community Health agent in Harris County. We also have Don Burton. Don, say hey. Hey, Don is a health specialist with Prairie View A and M Cooperative Extension Program, which is kind of we call them they our sister agency, but it's also extension. We do the same kinds of things, and then we also have Craig Rotter with us today, and Craig is the leader of the Texas Rural Leadership Program. Say hey, Craig. Hello, and, <laughs> hey, Amy. And I guess I should say Dr. Craig Rotter no. is with us. <laughs> so, all right. So this group, we are all part of the Coming Together for Racial Understanding work group that Extension has put together. And, you know, um, go, um, a few weeks ago, we did a show together. And we talked about how to flip the script on race and ethnicity. And we had some really great conversations about um things that we say to each other sometimes and how people respond to those. And uh, so what we wanted to do today is just take that conversation a little bit further and talk about um, the, the comparison between dialogue and debate. And, you know, one of the things that I notice when I say this, I often say debate versus dialogue. And like the first thing that comes to my mind is debate. And I'll mention, you know, debate first, because I think sometimes we're sort of like, um, programmed to think that debate is the ideal situation, you know, debate, I'm going to win by conversation, whatever it is that I have to make my point, right? So um, when we talk about some of the things that we mentioned with Flip the Script, I think that people often respond with, probably respond with debate first, but dialogue uh, might be one of the better ways to respond. And just just as a reminder, some of the things that we talked about when we talked about flipping the script and um, whether you're on either side of that conversation, you might respond with debate or with dialogue. Hopefully by the end of the show, you'll be convinced that dialogue is the best way to do that. But things like we don't see people of color or you are so articulate or she speaks English very well. Um, you're overly sensitive, and so how did you get this new position? Those are all some um, statements that might might elicit some debate, some dialogue, right? Craig, I see you smiling. Um, so, so just talk a little bit. We'll start with you, and then we'll kind of go through um, and give everyone a chance to uh, mention a few things about dialogue versus debate, debate versus dialogue. Like, what what is, what is the difference, and how do we know what that is? What does that mean to you, Craig? Oh, Craig, are you there we, muted? There we go. Yep, yep. I was. I <laughs> yeah. was. I wasn't even trying to talk. I was just uh, trying to hit the button. So, <laughs> but yes, uh, there is definitely a difference between the two. And uh, I think for, for most of us, um, it, it's really kind of slowing down a little bit and, and thinking about the, the conversation we want to have with people and and how we want to present ourselves relative to someone else. So it's it's, um, you know, the, to me, the word dialogue, uh, starting with the first two letters, you're looking at, at having at least two people uh, engaged and involved uh, in, in some sort of um, conversational mode. Uh, and, um, you know, not necessarily having to focus on, on your sides, but more likely uh, moving towards some sort of understanding uh, and where the other person sits versus, I don't even want to say the word versus because there's opposites then, right? Right, right. Uh, put that and in instead of versus, uh, you know, where, where, how I'm seeing things and how you are seeing things and, and what we can do to, to find that common ground is a, is a big plus in, in it. Debate, on the other hand, there are sides and, um, you know, and it's, it's not necessarily always trying to prove that someone else is wrong, but so often we find, especially in today's time, it's trying to, to be heard to the point that people are absolutely saying that, that you are, or in this case, if it was me, that I'm right. Uh, and, uh, and regardless of, of where others sit, 
So it, there's a huge difference between the two. Right, right. So, you know, often we think, well, what you just mentioned, you said uh, debate or dialogue means taking a little bit more time, whereas debate, we're usually like ready to just get in there and start. I'm going to make my point. I'm going to make it fast. And I'm going to be so swift and so strong with that point that there's no way that you could even argue with me, um, whereas dialogue is stopping and listening. And we'll, we'll talk more, too, later on in the show about some, some tips for or um, how to participate in conversations. And what we're talking about, too, here, obviously, is, is difficult conversations. And when we talk about race and race relations, sometimes that can be difficult. So, hey, Sanja, you want to fight? <laughs> Unmute? No, I, yep. I don't want to fight. I, <laughs> I want to just, you know, my how I think about dialogue and debate. Dialogue is finding a common ground or some type of mutual understanding and with debate it's like um like you're in a competition mm -hmm. and you're in a, a debate you know you know you're not listening you're just trying to prove your fact like your your facts are correct and that's not how dialogue is like i said dialogue is a mutual conversation mutual you know you can leave not agreeing but you're not winning with a true so-called winner there is no winner in um in in dialogue you know they're in debate you you think you won i won that but i mean the other person didn't even really hear you so you know both of you were playing different sports or having two different conversations you weren't involved in dialogue right and when i say hey you want to fight so that's just making the assumption too that debate means fighting but it, so it may not necessarily i mean there is obviously a place for debate in some place, you know, some, some things in the world. Um, there are debate competitions, um, but just in, in, in everyday conversations and when we're trying to connect with other people, debate is probably not the best way to connect with someone else, right? It's, it's not. And, you know, I think about, I think about just situations where I'm having conversations with people and, you know, body language is so important. Uh, with me, I have a tendency, you know, it's not that I'm a disagreeing with the person, but, you know, I'm just going to step back. I would just like fold my hands and, you know, <laughs> just tilt my head. And in that moment, it can, you know, a person can read that as I'm shut off, I'm closed, I'm closed out to the conversation. But internally, I'm really just trying to think and process what the person is saying. I don't want to make a judgment about what they're saying, I really want true understanding of what they're saying and what they're meaning. Right. So body language can uh, play a lot when you're in debate or even dialogue. Sure. And I think when, you know, you mentioned just that uh, body language, I can just jump to the conclusion and make the assumption that she is like closed off. She doesn't want to talk to me. She's not listening to me. So pff, I'm done with her. Um, or I can you know, stop, like, like Craig said, slow down just a little bit and consider the fact that maybe you are processing the conversation and what is being said. And even if, even if it is a little bit of a protective, um, you know, response, often we do that when we are having difficult conversations because they are difficult and they are uncomfortable. And so, and this can apply to any kind of conversation, but obviously one of the things that we focus on is um, conversations around race and race relationships, which can, which can be difficult. And sometimes we make some uh, um, immediate assumptions that may or may not be accurate, right? Right. And in dialogue, I think there's some form of education that's trying to take place. And all of us are, are educators. So I thought in that moment, it's, it's not a bad thing to, you know, to ask the person, do you understand what I'm saying? You know, do you get where I'm coming from? Am I making sense? You know, that's something that you can ask the other person in that moment. Right. And, and you know, if you see me like this, you know, say, just ask, um, what are you thinking right now? Or, you know, or, or do you understand what I'm saying? So that's something that we can consider. Just don't assume that, oh, she's left the conversation. She's not even here anymore. Right, right. So, Don, I want to hear from you. Share a little bit with us what you, um, how you see debate and dialogue or dialogue and debate. <laughs> well, you know, uh, 
my co our colleagues have done such an excellent job describing, I guess, some of the actions and, and things. I, I think about the feelings, in addition to what they're saying, the feelings that go along with the differences between the two. Um, you know, when it comes to dialogue, then I'm open, I am, I'm receptive, I'm, I'm calm because I, I'm interested, I'm, I'm ready to learn. I just, you know, it's more of a relaxing interest, positive feeling versus debate. I'm charged up. This is like it's a competition and I'm ready to get to my point. And, you know, it's, it's aggressive, very aggressive dialogue. I mean, debate is very aggressive in that you want to, it's a competition because I have to win. I have to get my point across and you have to agree. And I think that's another major difference. The difference between dialogue and debate is that in dialogue, it's okay to, dis to agree to disagree. Um, you can understand someone's point of view without uh, agreeing with it. And, and that's important because we all have uh, individual lived experiences that come from different places. And you know, there's a validity in honoring someone's position or point of view. And you don't have to agree with it, but there is uh, honor in, in hearing it and receiving it and acknowledging that it exists. Right, good, good points. Um, and so let's talk a little bit too about what do you, th I mean, hopefully, it may be obvious at this point, right? So dialogue is probably much more productive than debate. Debate could have its place, like I mentioned before, but um, let's talk more about the, the value in dialogue. Okay, well, and you know, when we think about it, there are competitions in school that teach children how to debate. And so you, it is ingrained to be able to win, win, win when it comes to conversations or when it comes to being on opposing sides. But there's value in human relationships. There's value in growth and development and just living your life, respecting the differences of others. We can have great uh, friendships and great conversations, even though we don't agree. And one story that comes to mind is of Daryl Davis, and he's a black musician. And he, because of an impromptu experience, and there's a TED talk for all of you who are interested and want to know the, the difference, uh, I mean, hear the details of it. Daryl Davis is a black musician that by uh, happenstance ended up in a conversation at a bar uh, with a Ku Klux Klan's member. And they had such a good conversation and it, it stimulated such curiosity that he went on to uh, research and investigate and engage in conversations with Ku Klux Klan people to the point where at the end of his uh, experience and time, I think it was over a course of uh, 20 years or so, he engaged Klan's people to uh, a conversation, get to know each other and establish relationships where he ended up attending a Klan's meeting. And that blew my mind that a black person willingly attended a Klan's rally. And, and from that, uh, there were people who, uh, he changed the minds of, I think the statistic was 200 uh, members gave up their robes because of the interaction and relationships that they had. And that just shows that it's okay to disagree um, but it, it also shows the value in listening and having a conversation and not being so charged to compete, but opening to hear one another and, and understand each other's perspective and points of view. Sure. Because when we think about debate uh, and competition, we think that there has to be winners and there has to be losers. Um, but just that, that story that you just shared is a great example of win-win. Like, like, you know, in, in human relationships, there doesn't have to be losers. We can all be winners. We can all come away with new information. And as uh, Sanja mentioned earlier, we're all learning from each other. We're all educating each other about our own experiences and our own lives. And that's, um, you know, kind of when we talk about race and race relationships, that's one of, one of the biggest steps forward is just accepting and understanding and appreciating the differences between us. Um, so Craig, do you have any kind of stories or anything that you want to add to dialogue versus debate? Or and debate, not versus. <laughs> you made that very clear, but not versus. <laughs> you're you're reframing, Amy, and that's a good thing. Uh, and and to me, the other thing is that there is a, a complexity uh, in the conversation either way. So there, you know, you don't lose the complexity by choosing dialogue uh, over debate. And debate is a very complex process if you really look at its history and 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 you measure. Uh, the back and forth. The, the difference is, and, and the choice made 
uh, to me is uh, dismantling the walls that come up uh, when you are deciding that you're going to debate something and instead choose to, to dismantle those walls and, and be more vulnerable. And, and the story that, that Dawn shared, there had to have been an increased vulnerability. You know, obviously people had had the way they saw things and the way they continue to see things, but you know, everybody likes to hear uh, their own truths right. and, and they like to speak their truths. But uh, to go back to uh, the, the story with Daryl, you know, as a musician, the other reality is, you know, there's music in my head, there's music in, in your head, Don's head and, and Sonia's head and anybody when we're in a conversation. It does, my music doesn't have to drown out your music as we're having the conversation. And, and that's to me, the, that's the beauty of dialogue is, you know, I give you a glimpse in, in terms of what I'm hearing uh, in the music in my head, and then I stop and will turn mine down in my head so I can hear the, the beat and, and the words to the music in your head. And, you know, we may still have different songs in our, in our heads, but the fact that we at least say it's okay, right, in, in the dialogue and that we can truly hear each other, that's the beauty in, in choosing dialogue over debate. Yeah, that's a great analogy of music in your head. And uh, you mentioned vulnerability, vulnerability, and that, um, you know, for a lot of people is a really scary thing. It's like, it, it's very scary to be vulnerable. Um, and it reminds me of, so one of my most favorite authors in the whole wide world is Brene Brown. And she does a lot of um, research on vulnerability and the power of vulnerability, which sounds counterintuitive. But, um, you know, once you hear the way she describes it and the, 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 just the, the power that we can find in vulnerability is, is um, for me, very inspiring, um, obviously, because like I said, she's one of my favorite. Sanjay, do you have additional thoughts to add to dialogue and debate? I have, I, I have a thought about vulnerability. Okay. I think we live in this age, in this moment, and we still have individuals who never interact with people from a different race. Mm-hmm. And I find that so unbelievable, but also just, I, I see it as uh, an opportunity to be vulnerable. So, you know, I would like to challenge people, if you have never had an experience or, you know, if, if you've never had a conversation with someone of a different race and you're out in, in the public and you see them, I would just, I would challenge them or seek, encourage them to seek the opportunity to just strike up a conversation and just start talking. It doesn't have to be about race, it can be about the weather, it can be about anything, but just strike up the conversation to be vulnerable. And at the same time, uh, because a lot of, um, let me go back, a lot of times they base their experiences on things that they've seen in TV, on TV or in the media, right. and they never had that one-on-one -on -one contact, that, that one-on-one -on -one interaction. But, you know, I encourage you to strike up a conversation with a person at the grocery store, at the doctor's office, wherever you are, just, just talk, just make it just, you know, conversation and just see how that goes. But at the same time, I don't want you to base that one conversation and make a generalized opinion or thought about uh, the race or the culture. Because um, my experiences are different from my siblings' experiences. And, you know, we all have, we all have different uh, opportunities and things that have happened in our life. So just don't be, don't be so quick to generalize and make quick assumptions about individuals, but just seek opportunities to be vulnerable and to explore and learn because right now we're, we're just, we're in a, a difficult period, but at the same time, it's a period of opportunity for us to learn about other cultures and just to interact more. If you never, you know, one thing I want to challenge myself, I have, I'm, I don't think I've ever been to a white church or, a, or mostly a predominantly Caucasian church. I think I wanted to experience that. I've seen it on TV, but to actually go in and sit and fellowship, I think that's something that I want to do. So there are opportunities for us all to be vulnerable. Right. And, it, and as you're going into those, um, going into those with the idea and the spirit of dialogue and openness and not 
you know, not that spirit of debate, right? So I'm like going in to see what I can learn from these other people, which that's that's kind of what you're talking about in terms of vulnerability, that it's, um, you know, if you've never been to a white church before, that that might be something that's um, very uncomfortable for you and make you feel very vulnerable um, because it's uncomfortable in a lot of different ways. So um, just opening up to that and then being open to what can I learn from this conversation, from this experience that will help me be a better person? Yes. I just think it's, I think it's a great opportunity. And, you know, I, I would welcome someone to come to my church. It's like having a uh, cultural exchange. <laughs> yeah. Um, one other thing that I wanted to mention about vulnerability too. So um, one of the previous shows we had uh, Michael Potter, the horticulture agent on, and we were talking about the freeze and the freeze damaged plants. And, and of course, you know, I've got to make everything into an analogy. And I was like, Oh, people are like that. Like you get, you get damaged from one experience and it makes you even more vulnerable. So he was talking about like when you prune away the part that's been damaged and then that, you know, for a while that plant becomes even more vulnerable. And so if another freeze comes in, then it can, um, you know, make them more susceptible to um, disease and, and those kinds of things than had they never been pruned back to begin with. So just taking care of, of um, each other and taking care of vulnerability, you know, people and plants, there's a lot of, a lot of similarities, a lot of um, things that we can, analogies that we can make from that. And okay. just treating everyone as an individual. Most definitely. Yes. And because because like you said, everybody has different experiences. And so just because I have one conversation with one person who is of a different race doesn't mean that I can just assume that everybody of that race has that same experience or feels that same way. And you mentioned siblings. And I think it's amazing. I think sometimes to, to meet people from the same family and like you have the same parents and you're like totally different people. Right. So how did you know, how does that happen? Because we're individuals and we all filter through our own our own lens of our own experience. So we also wanted to talk about tips for participating in difficult conversations. So once you get to the point where you are open to dialogue and um, ready to engage, um, we wanted to go through some tips that would kind of help you stay engaged and to maintain that um, that vulnerability that's that's needed to um, continue those conversations. And so um, we talked about uh, the, so a lot of tips. And and one of the first things that came up, Craig, was was your <laughs> your idea um, because you said that this was one of the things that you experienced. So you want to share that? Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely share. You know, one of the things that that um, came back to me was um, when I was in school. There was um, someone that um, we seemed to be complete opposites in in behaviors, and um, at times there was even a little bit of, of resentment. And uh, we were lucky enough to have a, um, a personality test uh, that we took uh, several of us at the same time, and we realized that that we really were complete opposites in in how we uh, absorbed information, uh, the time that was needed to process something before we spoke, and uh, and, and this and that. And so once that was realized uh, for us, I think that the, the good thing was that we, um, we for me personally, uh, I stopped jumping to uh, answer right away and gave this other person uh, the opportunity to, to process what, what they were thinking uh, and then to share. And, um, and then was catching that others were uh, not doing that after I caught myself doing that and had changed my behavior and at times um, said, uh, spoke up right away, but only to pause others from speaking and, and gave this other individual um, an opportunity to, to uh, process and, and then share what they were saying because they could get extremely frustrated when they never got a word in. And then you had almost a debate between two people that weren't that individual back and forth and the conversation not just left them out from the beginning, but kept them out. Right. And so right. for me, uh, the first tip that I would strongly suggest uh, as you're moving into this uh, frame of, of dialogue versus or, you know, as opposed to deciding to debate people, especially if you're passionate, is to listen and, and not just listen, but to listen very carefully uh, and making sure that others have a chance to speak and perhaps even making it a game for yourself that uh, instead of trying to be the first to speak, uh, being the last, 
and and turning your frame around in terms of having the last word or closer to the last word than than moving to the front always. And so I, I still have an issue with this myself in terms of interrupting people, uh, especially as as you I, I recognize that they may be closing their statements. Uh, and so uh, I'm still working on this, but the respect piece, if, if you keep respect as as one of your core values and actually demonstrate that I'm a leadership education um, expert and um, a leadership educator by profession with the Texas Rural Leadership Program and uh, in building that human capacity. And uh, that respect piece uh, is so key and it definitely helps if, if you will hush your mind and then hush your mouth um, you, you know, showing that respect to others is key. So listening carefully to others, I think, is is extremely key. Right. And, you know, speaking your mind freely, definitely share what's going on. But, you know, just don't take over the conversation or the discussion, because there are some t- personality types that are just like, yeah, they're not saying anything. So I'm going to just kind of keep on talking. And then there's people sort of like what Sanja mentioned when she mentioned body language. And, you know, as she's processing information, maybe she sits back and is kind of thinking through that. It's really easy for someone else to assume she doesn't have anything to say. So I'm just going to keep on talking because I've got things that I want to say. Amy. Yes, ma'am. So what Craig Craig just mentioned I also struggle, he said he interrupts. I also struggle with, in my mind, while a person is speaking, I'm trying to think of my response. Mm. So in in that moment, I've left the conversation. I don't know what they they even said, but that's something that I'm working on, like Craig is working on not interrupting, staying focused, staying in the moment with the conversation Mm -hmm. so that I can, you know, have a conversation, I can have dialogue and understand what they're trying to convey, opposed to in my mind, I'm trying to come up with my response. So it's it's a continuous process and it is, it is something that I'm working on. Right, and I think a lot of us are guilty of that. We um, don't listen to listen, we listen to respond. Um, and I think uh, Stephen Covey is the one that said, um, uh, seek first to understand and then to be understood. So that's another good piece of advice when it comes to that. All right. Yeah, those are- that's part of the seven habits for highly effective people. Right. So yes, you're exactly right. And and to me, uh, the, the visual image that I put into my head when I'm having a that conversation is that almost the having the, the person, whoever it is, and myself uh, picturing us getting onto a roller coaster at, at a theme park. And so if you can imagine sitting in the seats together, the intimacy of external factors now playing a greater factor in your life than the person sitting next to you, but you're there, you're, you're there to support and you're there to uh, experience that together. And so, you know, if you can picture yourself with that person getting into the seat on a roller coaster and, uh, you know, and when they say something, you're probably going to hear them more because there are going to be so many things shaking you that are outside of your head and that person's head. And, uh, and so you may find some clarity in, in realizing that what you have in common is uh, all of the external factors that you're facing while you're in that time together. It's right. a little strange analogy, but I find that that helps my brain because again, if I'm sitting with with you or, or Sonia or Dawn on a roller coaster, all of a sudden we're gonna experience something together and uh, that time together is, is so unique. Right, and um, I often think of, so I have two eyes, two ears, one mouth, use those in proportion, <laughs> look and listen, and then and then speak. So, um, Don, tell us a little bit about the tip that you have for dialogue and participating in dialogue. Uh, so my tip is do your best to understand others' point of view. And it, it follows along the lines of, of what everybody has shared in terms of uh, listening more and, and speaking less or being open. Uh, and and just, I guess, my effort to, first of all, piggyback on what, what Sandra was saying is that I, I forget my point if I don't hurry up and get it out. Right. And I was raised in an environment of cutting people off. Um, and so my mother will cut me off and I cut her off and, and it didn't, I didn't realize what was going on until I engaged in conversations with other people. And I realized, oh, that was rude. And so it it's a struggle from different perspectives in how to do a better job because that 
that ingrained debate effort is there. But getting back to uh, doing your best to understand other points of other people's points of view or others' points of view, the way I, uh, an anal analogy that I think of is when I had when my children or a loved one something happens to them and they're upset be it because somebody did something to them or maybe they tripped and fell whatever the case is when they approach me and there's something wrong i'm in a vulnerable open receiving situation and i am listening with all intent and and everything i have to find out what happened now if it's a little kid or they're extremely upset might not understand exactly what they're saying you might question the logic of whatever it is or the story that they're they're saying but just like with dialogue it's still important to hear them out and there's the desire to hear them out versus when it's a debate you're charged up and ready anxiously you know waiting for your time to attack whatever the vulnerabilities that you see mm -hmm. and so i see that as a, a an example of how to engage in dialogue just like when a loved one, be it an adult or a child, approaches you and they're exasperated, they're traumatized, you just want to fix the situation. And the only way you can fix the situation is to truly understand what happened. And so that means you have to intently listen and understand. Maybe you do ask a few probing questions because little kids logic sometimes not quite there, <laughs> you know, or if it's an adult that's extremely upset might not understand what is being said through the tears and you you know you're sensitive to that you're sensitive to their situation just like in uh dialogues with uh highly tension tension field conversations especially racism you know if there's a personal story that's being shared and and you know maybe it's evoking emotion you have to be patient and give them time and allow them to process and allow them if they're willing to share then it's important to give that person the time and space to get the information out. Mm -hmm. And if it was your child or someone you loved, you'd be more and willing, more than willing to be patient, to give them the time, extra few, a few extra boo-hoos, or give the child a, a few more minutes to go back through that story yet one more time for the 10th time, just so you can understand the level of detail that's needed so you can help to resolve it. Right. And what you're describing too, I think it's even more difficult. So when we're in difficult conversations, right? And and so what you've just described is someone you love, so you care about, you're patient with them because you care about them. But if someone that you already feel like maybe you have, you're on diametrically opposite sides and you're already, you know, kind of ready to find something wrong, you, that makes it even that much more difficult to stay engaged and listen and allow them time to share their experiences. Exactly, exactly. And what we find, what I, I believe happens in debate more so than dialogue is that competition is so deep that you, as soon as you see that maybe you're not winning, you shut down, mm -hmm. right? Or, or I shut down sometimes. I try at this point. I try not to compete. But there's the that win versus lose situation to where if you're not winning, then maybe the engagement stops. And mm -hmm. that's a problem too because it it needs to be an interaction. There needs to be a back and forth, and there needs to be the open, receptive um, hearing from both sides to be able to move the conversation forward. Whether you agree or not is not the point. It's to <laughs> understand whether it's un understand someone else's point of view. Yeah. And it, we, so one of the other tips that you had mentioned um, when we talked before is whether you disagree or not, like it's okay to disagree, right? Right, right. It's okay to, to not agree, um, you know, been, and, in, and that's the whole thing with debate. Debate, not only do I have to win my point, point, I have to get you to say mercy and agree with me, right? In mm -hmm. a debate, it's not only expressing a good point, but it's also winning the person over to your side. And the dialogue is the complete opposite. There's the win-win situation of both people being able to respect and understand the other person's point of view. Agreement is, is not, you know, it's not required. Right. And uh, so Sanjay, I want to call on you next for some tips participating in dialogue, what kinds of things do you want people to remember? I want people to remember that humor and a pleasant manner will always help. Like Don said, you you don't always have to agree, 
but we can laugh about it and just walk away, you know, knowing that we did not agree, but we do have that mutual respect for one another and, you know, in our personal experiences. That is so important. We forget the, the power and the therapy, the therapeutic nature of laughter, but it's okay. You know, just, just you know, that's how you feel. I can respect that. And, you know, we're good. You can still leave those conversations like that and not leave with a bitter taste or a bad uh, feeling about the other person, but you leave with uh, mutual respect that, you know, we're just not going to come to terms of agreement on this matter, but you've had your experiences and I've had mine. Right. And it, it, another important thing that I think when we talk about, I mean, using humor and adding a little bit of levity, levity to a conversation definitely is very helpful. Like it releases a lot of stress. It just, you know, and it's a good connection too, if we can laugh about something together. Um, I would just one kind of caveat caution that I would add to that is to make sure that that humor is appropriate and not misplaced in order to make fun of or put down or demean someone else. Because sometimes we hide pain and we hide meanness behind a guise of, oh, I was just joking. And kind of what we talked about before with Flip the Script, like, why are you so sensitive? I was just joking. Um, so just to add add a little bit to that. So use humor, that's a, that's but use it appropriately. Point. And, you know, th- not leaving thinking that that person was um, attacked you know, mm-hmm. or they laughed at me, but we're laughing with one, we're laughing together, not at one another, but together in agreement. Mm-hmm. Yes, definitely. And what you mentioned before, too, about people having different types of experiences, maybe people react a little differently to humor. Um, you know, something that I think is just, you know, <laughs> and maybe something that hurts you deeply. And I don't, because I don't understand your experiences, or I haven't taken the time to um, come to a place where the humor that we might use between each other is understood and acceptable. And I say something that could be um, mean, inappropriate, and again, hiding behind humor. So you and when that it. happens, you know, instead of in that moment addressing it, you know, maybe you, I cool down. I think I've had situations like this before. I cool down and then, you know, maybe call the person or ask them, well, what exactly did you mean by this? Mm-hmm. I'm trying to get understanding. I'm trying to understand, you know, what they were actually saying. And in my mind, I may have built up this whole scenario. They were making fun of me or they were laughing at me. But in essence, it wasn't that at all. Learning learning when to approach situations or, or comments. Definitely. All right, Craig, do you have another um, tip for us? Yeah, even, well, and just listening to the, the conversation we've had in the last few minutes, to me, I think um, if you're going to be in a mode where you're wanting to, and you have, you cannot help yourself that you're wanting to move to debate, uh, perhaps have a debate with yourself <laughs> inside your head about your behaviors before you exhibit them and, and before you move to conversation with the other person. So, you know, I always believe that there are better angels and uh, in our in our heads. And uh, keeping three things in mind, I think, would be a plus. One would be um, the difference between respect and and disrespect, and is my are my thoughts and how I present them uh, in in the conversation going to be disrespecting another human being, regardless of how we see things. So that's a. Uh, B would, in my mind, is is the notion of human dignity, and I always think of uh, a, a much older human being and and the dignity uh, of a person when they are very very old and, and can't take care of themselves as much anymore, and and that spirit of feeling not necessarily feeling sorry but feeling empathy uh, for that person. You know, maybe their pants aren't quite up all the way, or you know, an issue is happening here or there and, and they just can't help it. But keeping that in, in your mind, that the, the, dig, the, the greatest amount of dignity that you could hold for somebody else uh, and have that debate in your head before you move and, and demonstrate dignity. And the third one is uh, equity. And, and can we move to, to equity in the conversation? Not somebody has to win and somebody has to lose, but the notion that um, that with dignity and, and with respect, that somebody could get what they need out of the conversation and how they see things, 
but I also can walk away with a sense of equity because we spent the time. You know, the, the greatest thing we can spend with another person is time, mm. right? Yeah, right? And and we're so silly and, and we should be able to laugh about we laugh too often maybe about the amount of time that we, we truly have in this world, right? Just to dig deep for a second. But if we would focus on every single conversation as being a part of that sand and in, in our hourglass and, and how we want to present ourselves in, in that moment as one moment of time, I think we, you know, reframing that uh, is also critical. So how are we spending that time with another person? And when we walk away from that moment, how do we want to feel and how do we want them to feel uh, in giving them a gift of, of taking some of our time, um, you know, and being a little selfish and recognizing the quality of our time. And, and are we going to waste it or are we going to spend it with greater quality uh, and equity uh, between one another? And so, again, it's just it's reframing a lot of factors that we just don't think about. Right. And yeah. Good so, and one thing I wanted to add to that was uh, assuming positive intent. You mm -hmm. know, when we talk about race relations and racism and all those other words that trigger us or any uh, situation that could be filled with conflict and you go into a discussion, it's better to, first of all, take a moment and breathe and understand that you need time to process. This is difficult, but if you push through it, like with your plan analogy, you need rain. Too much rain can drown. If there's cold temperatures, it can freeze and do amount of, uh, so much harm. But it's important to have the water that gives all the nutrients to really uh, feed the plant systems. And the natural rain is so much better than the whatever's coming out of the uh, out of the faucet for some reason. But I digress. It's it's the the rain that does so much. And just like rain, you have to be in a good place. And so it's important to take time to breathe and center yourself in a positive space and realize that you are going into a difficult conversation so that you can be open open and all the other tips that we've given and assume positive intent, just like Sonia said. You know, we can get so caught up in our own stories, our own perspectives, that we completely misunderstand whatever is being told when the intent uh, was nothing like what we assumed. But if we assume positive intent, if we assume positive intent, just like when a loved one approaches us, we're assuming whatever they, they say is po not necessarily positive, but whatever they say, we're honoring it. And so that positive intent helps us to honor whatever we're hearing somebody say, whether we agree with it or not. So I just wanted to throw that in. Yeah, yeah. No, I appreciate that because I, yeah. So we, I mentioned Brene Brown earlier, and one of the things that she talks about is um, just assuming every person you meet is th this person is doing the very best they can because sometimes we have these stories that we make up in our heads that someone's against us they're you know that the world is a what against us or whatever and we um we we make up worst case scenarios in our mind and then it are automatically puts us on the defensive with other people um but if we are assuming the well, like you said, assuming, assuming the best intent, that that person is doing the very best that they can and they're, they're, they have very good intentions, um, it'll make a big difference in the way we interact with, with everybody that we interact with. And kind of going back to what Craig said too, just really um, appreciating those um, conversations and those relationships that we have. And one of the tips that I was going to give, and I said that I would do this at the very beginning, um, is to keep the discussion on track. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes we got really excited about the things we're talking about and, uh, you know, we'll, we chase a few, a few rabbits. But what happens often in difficult conversations is that we tend to deflect. And so we'll, you know, we're trying to talk about something that is um, – hard to talk about that's uncomfortable and then we maybe sometimes we deflect with humor um, and then let's going back to that conversation so that's a little bit of an inappropriate use of humor but not that you shouldn't insert that sometimes but bring it back to this this is the discussion that we're talking about this is the point that we need to make and you know what whatever it is or wherever you're at in that conversation but just trying to keep on track and um, because sometimes we will kind of deflect and just say, you know, try to change change the subject or talk about something else instead of what really um, needs to be talked about or what we really want to talk about. That's true. Yeah. So uh, we uh, wanted to mention, too, a couple of times, so it, it's easy to see, you know, 
here's all these tips for being a good dialogue person. And then you get into the heat of a conversation and that may be difficult to remember all of that. So there's, there's some current hot topics that are out there, right? That, um, especially around race and race relationships. And so we wanted to talk um, just, you know, in these last few minutes, we have um, just a couple minutes left. And so kind of want to go around um, to each one of you and talk about um, just just briefly some of those, how do you stay in the moment and in dialogue in current hot topics? So whatever it is that, you know, is on your mind right now, social movements, politics, the disparities is a um result of the recent winter storms that we had, all of those kinds of things. Um, and Don, let's, I see you on screen, so let's start with you. Okay. So, uh, you know, first thing, I guess the self-focus and self-practice with anything and understanding that within disparities and inequities, there's only so much you can do. I get overwhelmed sometimes uh, when I, I just see how much hurt or how much uh, devastation has been done. And so I have to calm down, I have to breathe, and then I have to figure out what is my wheel of influence? You know, with the winter storm, what can I do? I might not be able to save and help all of the uh, people who were negatively impacted, but there are certain things that I can do. And that's where I think it's important to start. What can I do? How much can I give? Where can I go? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't always have to be about money. You know, people like to be checked on. And so as it relates to the winter storm, just reaching out to people I know and just giving a check to say, hey, are you okay? Do you need anything? What do you need and how I can help? And I find that that's beneficial because it takes the focus off of me and it puts the focus on someone else. And even if I'm experiencing something negative, just that human re interaction, that, that human connection and contact lifts my spirits. And then it also can lift the other person uh, that I'm engaging with, lift their spirits too. And sometimes all you need is a good hug. You know, I mean, I, I, it's not, to me, it's nothing better than a really good hug. And in the midst of the devastation, I might not be able to donate millions of dollars to fix all the problems, but definitely I can be a listening ear. I can, you know, if I have food to share, then I can do that. And I can just listen because sometimes people just need to get it out. They need to talk. They need to share. They need to hear themselves think out loud. And so I, I really believe in when it comes to a difficult situation, when it comes to all of the chaos and craziness that's going on in life, taking a moment to, to breathe and figure out what I need and what I can do and starting with me and then moving forward as much as I can do. And if I get to a point where it's too much, hey, I need to cut the news off. I've seen quite enough. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's important right. to know what your limits and boundaries are. And once you reach those limits and boundaries, it's okay to stop because you have, I feel like each individual person needs to take care of themselves. Self-care is so important and you know your limits. Each individual knows their limits. And if they don't, I encourage them to explore their limits and focus on finding out what your limits are. You know, if you watch news typically 24 hours a day and by the time you go to bed, you are exasperated, exhausted and worn out, maybe you should dial that back a little bit. <laughs> you know, maybe you cut it down to you know, once in the morning, once in the afternoon, or, or you give yourself uh, smaller doses of the news okay. so that you can process it all. Thanks, Don. Craig, we're going to go to you next. You have been into some heated dialogues, right? So, yeah. So you want to share a little bit? Yeah, I think for me, um, in, in looking age, age helps you look at things good, bad, and, and ugly in life. And I think... In looking at the last few years and, and even through the winter storm that we just faced in Texas a couple of uh, weeks ago, you know, there there really is, unfortunately, by human behavior, uh, there is a, a true and unfortunately uh, an, a, a, a real uh, bloody trail of victims uh, in terms of how we have treated one another. And I like that we touched on vulnerability. I like that we uh, we touched on uh, on uh, keeping it light, but the other piece is keeping it true. And and one thing that uh, Don and I had a conversation the other day, uh, and uh, very recently, and and just thinking through the, the bit of history that we do not know uh, and that wasn't taught to us, and so some of the truths that we base our our reality today on 
aren't necessarily true, uh, but it's what we've been taught. And so how do we turn that around and, and awaken ourselves? So instead of creating more victims uh, in along this trail called life, maybe we are moving ourselves to a place where we are not, not healing from the standpoint of um, covering over old wounds, but, but bringing the reality that is there to our existence now and having not debate, but having the dialogue about what our history, where our history has placed us now. And, and so I know that's a little deeper than we may go often, but if we're ever gonna get to a better place in the generations ahead, we really, I really do think that we need to move to having truthful dialogue about what the history actually was and the history we're creating now. Yeah, because I yeah. bet that if we looked at some of the things that have happened already in 2021, uh, if we could go up 50 years from now and look back, we would be embarrassed that we didn't stand up uh, and, and hold each other up better as human beings in the time we had versus, again, creating more victims uh, along the trail uh, by our own behaviors. And so we've got to do a better job collectively and, and having a mindset of dialogue and, and stepping away from debate uh, in a game show uh, atmosphere, right? American culture, broader. Uh, there's always competition and we're always trying to push the button first before someone else pushes it, right? right? I think a family feud when the two families go up there, right? We live that every day because that's how we've been conditioned. And, mm -hmm. and how cool would it be for a family to switch over and go over to the other side and help them come up with answers and then go back to your side of the room, right? And, and, and change the game right. moving forward. Yeah. So I think what you've encouraged us today and Amy, in, in terms of bringing us to the show, is to uh, spend some time in our week uh, reflecting on what we could do better and, and what's going to come out of our mouths and, and whom to whom we may offer ourselves in, in conversation that we may not meet or, or may not know in our day to day. Yeah. And Sanjay, you were telling me you were ready for a family reunion and you want to go to a white church. What are your last little <laughs> thoughts that you have? <laughs> Well, I, I just thought about some of the words that Don spoke, and I, I believe empathy, you know, em being empathetic to to others on both sides, you know, even the ones who choose debate, being empathetic in, to them also. Uh, and doing that one thing that I can do, I, I looked up this poem that I always, um, it's not a poem, it's more of a, just, just strong words, and it's, it's a quote by Edward Everett Hale. I am only one, but still I am one. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do something that I can do. There's something that we all can do. Don spoke about, um, you know, just being being there to listen to someone. You know, we, in extension, we have access to all types of resources, resources that we hear come from the, from the job, from the county, but being able to share those resources with individuals, listening to them. Some, some of my uh, volunteers right now, they're stuck at home. They don't, they don't know when they're gonna be able to get out and do the things that they wanna do. Sometimes they just need someone to listen, someone to just talk to them. And I really feel for our vulnerable populations, the homeless, the seniors, they just need someone. So just doing that one thing that I can, and, and like Don said, not overthinking it, not doing too much, practicing self-care, but doing the one thing that I can so that at the end of the day, I can close my eyes in peace. I love that. that and love, I love the conversation that we've had. And you know what? We've been, we've been talking for a while now, and um, we probably could talk for a few more hours, which we will come back and we will have more of these conversations is coming together for racial understanding. Um, we've got a few of our other um, cohorts that we would like to bring into the show sometimes, um, too, to talk about different types of things, because, you know, it's not something that's going to be solved in just you know, a one hour conversation. And so that dialogue that we're talking about is going to have to be an ongoing dialogue that we continue to do, um, 
even, even when it's hard and even when we get tired of it, we have to continue to, to dialogue and, and uh, dialogue more than we debate. Um, but we have run out of time for today for this extension hour. We're here on Fridays, 1 to 2 p.m., and we talk about our people, our programs, our partnerships, and I love having coming together for racial understanding because that is really all about people. And we will be back next time. But thank you guys so much for joining us today. It was great seeing you, and we'll see you next time.